Hey everyone, welcome to our online service. My name is Johnny Levi, and today we're starting a new series called The Good Book, where we're going to look at the origin, the trustworthiness, and the purpose of the Bible or the scriptures. So make sure that you stick around for the next three weeks that you tune in as we explore that together. We've been having outdoor services and the weather has been so nice. If you've been thinking about maybe wanting to come, it is safe. We can sing together and we can fellowship together. It's just been a really sweet time. So if you're wondering why maybe you haven't been getting those emails, it could be because you haven't signed up for our Connect card yet. So head over to our website, Cedar Grove, dot org and sign up for that connect card so you can start getting those emails and if you're on the wait list i would encourage you still sign up for the outdoor service because that helps us to know how many people are potentially coming and if we need to offer a second service or not so make sure you sign up for that well joel is kicking off our new series today called the good book Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. It's your lucky day because we're starting a new series. We're starting a new series, it's a three week series, just will take us through the month of March and uh, it's called The Good Book. The Good Book, have you heard of that phrase before? The Good Book. If you type it into Google, you'll find the definition, it just says two words, the Bible. In fact, that's what the Oxford Dictionary says as well, the Bible, and Webster's Dictionary, the Bible. <laughs> and that's. That's really what we're talking about. It's been referred to as the good book. We're talking about the Bible. Now, at this church, we love to teach the Bible, but this series is gonna be a little bit different. Again, only three weeks. We're still gonna look at some scriptures, but really it's not just teaching the Bible, it's teaching about the Bible. And so it's a very targeted series. Uh, I can almost assure you that there will be some things shared that you didn't know before or you had forgotten, and so uh, maybe that'll encourage you. And uh, at the end of the day, I just want our faith to be strengthened. I want our, our, uh, us to be like sort of encouraged and have more confidence in the scriptures, all right? So now when we call the Bible the good book, I know that drives some people a little bit batty. They think that's crazy. They're like, the good book? What are you talking about? The Bible is filled with all kinds of terrible things, greed and envy and revenge and violence and incest and polygamy and, and violence of various forms and wars and I mean just all kinds of terrible things and there's some weird stuff and gross stuff and it's terrible and heinous and gnarly and disturbing. So how can you call this book the good book? What's so good about it? And I think a lot of us would hear that challenge and just kind of go, well, whatever, it's still really great. And I wanna encourage us to lean into the question, like why do we call it the good book? What's so good about it? And not necessarily to ignore those weird things because a lot of us have a, a, a relationship with the Bible kind of like this, kind of like we have a relationship with, you know that awkward person in your family, maybe it's a cousin, aunt, uncle, grandparent, just somebody in your family that's just a little bit different, you know them? And if you can't think of them, it might be you, but there's that different uh, person and you just don't know what to do with them. You know, you're not so sure about them. Now, on one hand, they're kind of interesting. They're eccentric. They're, they're, they'll tell zany stories. You don't know what's gonna come out of their mouth next. You know, sometimes on Christmas or your birthday, they bring gifts. They might be kind of strange gifts or great gifts, but they bring gifts and by and large, you, you appreciate them and they're lovable in that sense, but they're also a little bit odd and awkward and peculiar and, and strange and you're not sure if you wanna be seen in public with them and you're not sure what to do with them when you're with them. But hey, they're family, so let's get along and let's all pretend like everything's normal here even though everybody's going, what is coming out of their mouth right now? And like, what's going on right now kind of thing, right? Well, I think that's a lot how, uh, uh, a picture of how many people relate to the Bible, even Christians. Like on one hand, oh, it's, it's adorable and wonderful and good. On the other hand, I, let's just skip that passage. Let's ignore that part. The truth is you don't have to get very far until you'll, you'll read about a talking snake. That's, is that, come on, is that weird? That, that's a little weird. That's a lot weird, all right? And there's other things like that in the Bible. So many of us have this strange relationship with the Bible. So 
where did it come from? What, what's the purpose of the Bible? What, what do we do with the weird, odd stuff? Obviously, there's plenty of people who don't believe that the Bible is God's uh, word. They reject that notion. Bill Maher, the comedian, said this, I don't believe God is a single parent who writes books. I think that the people who think God wrote a book called the Bible are just childish. So there you go. I know Bill Maher is usually really afraid to share his opinion, but... Uh, there his view came out. I'm, I'm kidding about that. But let me just share this scenario with you. And I think it's something that probably many of us can identify with. Um, somebody grew up going to church, you know, their, their parents believed in the Bible, you know, mom or dad or both or something like that. And so they went to church and youth camps and whatever else. And, and uh, you know, Easter and Christmas. And then they went off to college. They got to their university and they decided to take an introduction to the Bible as literature course. And it was taught by a professor who had a PhD, seemed to know what he's talking about, and, but he, didn't, he wasn't a Christian. He didn't believe in the Bible, but he knew a lot about the Bible, right? And he started sharing some things with you and you thought, man, this is like interesting. And all of a sudden before long, like the end of the semester, you have this crisis of faith. Do I even believe in this book anymore? Do I believe in the Bible? Or maybe it, you didn't go off to university. Maybe it's just like you clicked on that YouTube video and you're like, oh, this is interesting. And you started watching that, you know, and before long, you're just like shocked and disturbed and, you know, your faith is crumbling and that sort of thing. And I, I guess, I guess I just want to encourage you and say, look, you know what? There's actually reason to believe in the scriptures, in the Bible. And um, it's interesting, however, how the same information given to two equally intelligent and two equally rational people, those people can respond very differently. Isn't that weird? Like some person, it's a crisis of faith, and some, another person hears the same information. And they were at that course too, and they have greater faith in, in the scriptures, right? For some people, the Bible is so implausible. Like how, how is that possible? And other people, the Bible is like, man, it's so stunning. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's powerful, it's incredible. They're surprised and amazement and, and, and captivated by it, and it's just, it's awesome, right? Like, so what is it about that? Like, receiving the same information, responding totally different, completely opposite conclusions. I think some of it, not all of it, but I think some of it has something to do with some of the basic assumptions that we have about the Bible, things that maybe we were taught or just things we assumed about the Bible. And then when we hear something that um, contradicts that belief, it's not even an essential belief, but that thing that we held on to, then all of a sudden, you know, it kind of takes the legs out from our uh, faith. So again, we're teaching about the Bible. Um, this isn't necessarily a series that I'm an expert in. I will tell you, I do not consider myself a biblical scholar. I know a lot of pastors just think they're biblical scholars because they teach the Bible. No, there's a, trust me, there's a whole nother level like four levels up of scholarship. These are people with like four PhDs. They've spent their life pouring into the Bible. A lot of them are a little socially awkward, but they're brilliant and they're wonderful and they're amazing. And I'm nowhere, I'm, a, I'm just a pastor. I've probably, you know, given a thousand plus sermons and messages over the years, but I'm not a scholar. I'm not a, a, an expert in some of these areas. So I'm gonna lean on scholars who are, this is a complicated kind of subject. Some people love the complexity. Other people are nervous about the complexity, but we're gonna dive in a little bit anyway, and I'd love for our confidence to, to grow as a result of this series. So I guess the, the last question I'll ask you before we really dive further into the, the sermon in this series is, how would you describe your relationship with the Bible? That's the way I'm gonna phrase it. How would you describe your relationship with the Bible? On again, off again, um, I don't know, it's interesting. Maybe it's something that you like, you believe in, you don't spend a lot of time in. Maybe it's something you just pour into, you love it. Maybe you treat it kind of like a textbook or maybe like a love letter. But how would you describe your relationship with the Bible? And what comes to mind when you even hear that word, Bible? You know, maybe your mind goes to a specific Bible sitting somewhere in your home or one you grew up with as a kid or something like that, but what comes to your mind? That's where I kind of want us to start. What is the Bible? Three thoughts about what the Bible is. Number one, the Bible is a library. The word Bible actually comes from the Latin word biblia, which means book. 
which is a little bit misleading because the Bible technically isn't, it is, but it isn't a book. It's a collection of books. We could call the Bible a library. In it is a uh, mini library of 66 writings, documents, books, um, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. That makes up the Bible. So when we pick this up, it's a Bible. By the way, the word Bible is not, doesn't occur in the Bible, so that's an extra biblical word. I guess we'll put it that way. I was going to say unbiblical. That sounds like it's wrong. It's not wrong, but uh, extra biblical word. So, um, but yeah, when we pick it up, sometimes we think, oh, it's, it's this book. No, it's a little mini library of books. However, it has a cohesive message, and that's number two. The Bible is a connected story. There's a unified story behind it. So different books, we've got different forms and genres, prophecy, um, narrative, uh, poetic, uh, apocalyptic, epistles. I mean, there's all kinds of forms and genres, different kinds of writings, but there's one unifying thread and message. There's a meta narrative, the redeeming heart and the redeeming plan of God through his son Jesus by his spirit, uh, rescuing the people he loves. I mean, we see that message all throughout the sweeping story or meta narrative of the entire. Uh, Bible. So it's this connected story. So the, the way you might want to think of it, maybe, I don't know, but uh, some of you are into like the, the Marvel movies. In the MCU, the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, right now there are 23, I believe, Marvel movies. Yes, I'm including The Incredible Hulk. It probably doesn't belong there, but anyway. Uh, 23 movies, and they're all unique. I mean, um, let's see, the Guardians of the Galaxy is different than Doctor Strange, different than the Thor, different than Captain America. They just have like a different vibe, feel, and that sort of thing, but you'll see like a common thread throughout them, and you actually saw that in the Infinity War and the Endgame, the last two movies. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But uh, nonetheless, there is, this is the idea of different, you know, you got Ant-Man and the Wasp, that's different than Iron Man, but there is a thread that connects them all that's sort of like the Bible, I guess, <laughs> kind of like that. So there's, there's my terrible illustration. So it's a library. The Bible is a connected story. And then lastly, it is both divine and human. I don't mean that some books are divine and some are human. No, each book, each document, each writing is equally divine, fully divine, fully human. And to illustrate this, I want to show you a drawing by M.C. Escher. You thought I was going to say M.C. Hammer, but no, M.C. Escher, and just a, a famous a drawer, uh, and uh, too legit to quit. And uh, anyway, so he, he was famous for drawing optical illusions and visual paradoxes and that sort of thing. And so we've got this drawing, it's called Drawing Hands, cleverly titled Drawing Hands, and it's a picture of, of course, two hands that are drawing. You got the top hand and the bottom hand. The question is, is the top hand drawing the bottom hand or is the bottom hand drawing the top hand? And the answer, of course, is, is both. They're simultaneously distinguishable in their presence, but they're indistinguishable in what they're doing, in their role. So it's a both and situation. And there are some realities that exist as one while at the same time being Two, it's not either or, it's two distinct things, but it's both and, and that's kind of the Bible. So the Bible is not a human word without being a divine word. And it is not a divine word without being a human word. And this is actually what the Bible says about itself. It doesn't say that it's only divine, and it doesn't say that it's only human. It says that it is both. But something has happened in the last couple hundred years. Now, I, I think most people who are not believers would obviously say, well, the Bible is human, written by people, but it's certainly not divine. In fact, I don't even know if I believe in God. But it's interesting, in Christian circles, I think the last couple hundred years, what's happened is we believe that the Bible is the word of God, and it is, and it's divine, and it is. But that's not all it is. It's also human. And we kind of leave out that portion of it. So imagine we could erase the top hand, let's say if that's the divine hand or something like that. And that's what many skeptics have done throughout history. Well, Peter addresses this in 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll just read 19, verses 19 through 21. Listen what he, what he writes here. We also have the prophetic message 
as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place, like in other words, just don't miss it until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Verse 20, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, that's important, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, right? Though human, spoke from God. So a lot of people want to erase the divine portion of the scriptures and they want to get rid of the, the God part. And other people, and even Christians, kind of want to eliminate the human part. They think that the Bible should just sort of be this magical book, you know, and I don't know. But, but they want to remove the human part, right? It's the word of God. It's not the word of Samuel, the word of David or Daniel or Paul or Luke or John Mark. or It's the word of the Lord. It is the word of the Lord, but it's also their word too. Like you even see their personalities come through and their, their writing styles come through. So what we don't believe is that people went into a trance and they kind of, uh, you know, went into some sort of spiritual subconscious kind of state and forgot where they were and who they were. And like they just started, you know, writing, writing on the scrolls, you know, just writing. And then they snapped out of it and they're like, oh, look, the book of Isaiah, you know, that we don't believe that happened. And so that seems really magical and it kind of is, it's fanciful. It's not actually how what the Bible says about itself. That's not how it was written. And by the way, if that were the case, it would have to happen like 66 different times since there's 66 different books of the, of the Bible. So the point is, is some people look at the Bible and they say, well, yeah, humans were involved, I mean, but they're kind of incidental. And I would say, no, they're not incidental. They're a part of the writing of scriptures. And, and I, I, that doesn't bother me, right? That doesn't... Uh, defeat my, my faith, right? So <clears throat> we've covered a little bit about what the Bible is, but how did it come into existence? And let me just say this. If you one day were sitting on your couch watching the History Channel and a show came on about the formation of the Bible and that had you intrigued because you're a follower of Jesus. So you started watching it and they had some dude with a PhD on and very convincing. At the end of it, you just kind of felt like, your, your faith was a little bit shaken and rattled, and you're like, man, he made some good points, and how do you argue with that? Can I just tell you, whatever the History Channel has told you about the formation of the scriptures, eliminate that. Like, have you seen the movie Men in Black where they got that little device, and you're like, you forget, you know, everything that happened? Like, that's what you need to do, because what those shows often tend to do is they'll get somebody with a PhD, they somehow got a PhD, uh, but they share this really obscure, very fringe view that most of scholarship doesn't share, all right? And the reason why they do that is because there's gonna be more interest, more viewers, more shock value, and that drives, right, viewership, which drives money, right, and, and that sort of thing. So I'll just tell you, the History Channel is not your firm foundation, okay? Uh, neither is the Da Vinci Code, the, the book or the movie. It's not a good firm foundation. The Da Vinci Code says about itself that it's a historical fiction, emphasis on fiction. Like, it literally said, this is historical fiction. It's not true, like, at all. And if there was a small group of select people who hand-selected which books to uh, include in the Bible so that they could dominate the world, well, they did a bad job, okay? Because <laughs> that doesn't make any sense why they would select the books that they did. You know, they select the books about, you know, dying to yourself and serving others and loving Jesus and that sort of thing. So anyway, just get out your men in black device. You know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry, but, you know, and just... Eliminate those members, like they're, it's not good scholarship. Understand that there are people with like five doctorates spending their lives pouring over their scripture, over the scriptures and they're, they're really bright. Now let me ask you this, do people tend to, would you say that in general people like want to obey the teachings of scripture? Like they just open it up, they're like, man, I can't wait till I find what God wants to tell me so I can go out and do it so that I can really be obedient. Like, is that pe how people approach scripture? Well, 
Of course, you and I know, of course not. They, they don't approach scripture that way, right? And see, here's what my point is like, what happens is a lot of times people don't understand what's already, they're not reflective, they're not introspective of what's going on inside of them, in their minds, in their hearts. And they kind of like just sort of dismiss it or whatever. But there's something in there that's like, I don't want to follow Jesus anymore, right? Then they watch the History Channel or the, read the Da Vinci Code or whatever it is, right? Or have some conversation or they turn on like, oh, there's a, there's a program on YouTube, you know, that really sounds convincing. And, and so they listen to that and like they've abandoned now their faith. Well, the truth is their faith has been slipping away for, for a long, long time. You guys, we gotta be... <laughs> more deeply rooted in our faith and have some more kind of staying power of perseverance than just watching a couple programs from people we don't know just like rattle our faith. That doesn't need to be the case. And that's what I want to communicate to you. So the Bible actually mentions a number of times the writing of the Bible or the writing of the scriptures in various places. In fact, we just looked at one passage in 2 Peter chapter 1. Do you know where the first place is? The first place that the scriptures mention the writing of scriptures. I'll tell you. It's in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17. And so God preserved and trained and raised up Moses. And Moses confronted Pharaoh and let my people go, you know. And Pharaoh's like, be stubborn. No. And then there's the plagues and that sort of thing, right? And then finally, Pharaoh relented and Israel gets out of Egypt, out of slavery, and they're headed to the promised land. There's the splitting of the Red Sea. Uh, I don't know, the cloud, the fire, water out of a rock. I mean, food miraculously appears. You know, all kinds of like amazing thing. God protects them. God provides for them. But they're just this big, massive group, these Israelites. Some people think there's two million of them, but, but a lot of them, and they're heading up to the promised land this land they've never been to before because they've been enslaved in Egypt. And on their way, there's these other people that notice them and they seem like an easy target, easy prey, right? So the uh, Amalekites were one of those groups and they attacked them. So the Amalekites attacked, let me just pick it up here, Exodus chapter 17, verse eight, it says, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God, not any old staff, the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. So Moses is now overlooking the battle. The battle's happening, and the oddest, weirdest, strangest thing happens when Moses lifts up, what is it called? The staff of God. When he lifts up the staff of God, the Israelites start winning. Here's the problem. Moses is an old man at this point, right? So he's an old man. He's probably got rotator cuff issues, you know, something like that. And he's tired. And so the staff lowers and the Israelites start losing. So they get a rock for him to sit on. And then um, Aaron and her lift. They literally hold up Moses' arms so he can hold up the staff of God. And wouldn't you know it as they do, God Went, like defeats uh, the Amalekites for them, through them, with them, and they're victorious. And then the very next verse, verse 14, Exodus chapter 17 says, then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll. Put this down as something, why? To be remembered. I don't want you to forget. I don't want your, the next generation to forget, and especially Joshua, and make sure Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Because Joshua is going to take over for Moses after Moses died, and Joshua is going to be the general that fights the battles and leads them into battle in the, the promised land. But the idea here is don't forget. Remember that the Lord has been good. The Lord has been with you, and he helped you defeat those evil people who were to attack you. Remember it. How are you going to remember? Write it down. Now, sometimes the Lord would say, here's how you're going to remember it. You're going to have a meal like the Passover meal. And you're gonna taste things, you're gonna experience things, you're gonna do things. But other times there were writings, scriptures 
that could be shared and read and uh, passed down from one generation to the next generation. So you got meals and texts, and you're, these texts are recording this, this foundation about uh, who we are and how desperately we're in need of God and how good God is, how holy he is, how just he is, how powerful he is, how, how he has given his people victory, how much he loves his people. And so we got to remember those things, and that's what the scriptures record, all right? So this occurs over and over and over again throughout the scriptures, where it's like, write this down, write this, remember this, this kind of thing. And that's the account of the kind of the origin, the general thought behind how the Bible was constructed. The Bible was written by, wait for it, human beings. Oh, yes. It did not float out from the, you know, it didn't fall from the sky on golden tablets. Hopefully not, you know, hitting anybody on the way down. Like Dorothy's house in the uh, Wizard of Oz on that Wicked Witch of the East. I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, so it's not golden tablets. It's not somebody in a trance. No, people. God's people who God spoke to, who God commissioned wrote these things down. And so Moses is the first figure to write. And oral tradition would have been passed down. Obviously, he wasn't alive during the book of Genesis, for instance. But those stories would have been passed down generation after generation. He writes them down so that his human words become the vehicle through which God God announces himself and God reveals himself. It's one of the key ways God reveals himself special revelation through his word. But Moses, you see, is he the only author? No, he is not the only author. In fact, yes, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Jews would call them the Torah, the teaching, the instruction. And uh, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he wrote them, but he actually wasn't the only one to write the Torah. Did you know that? He had some help. I don't know if that makes you nervous, but he did. And um, for instance, Deuteronomy chapter 34 records Moses' death, where he was buried, how long the people mourned after his death, you know, some details that Moses wouldn't have known about. So this would have been an editorial edition. Well, that's not good. Moses is the author. I can't trust whoever this other person is. Well, you can't even trust Moses, okay, except for the fact that Moses was um, inspired by God to write the scriptures. And so we would presume that any of these other editors were as well. And it's okay. if we It's not about Moses. It's about God. God used Moses to write his word, and he uses other people to write his word as well. There's another passage, for instance, um, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 used to kind of bother me because here's what it says. Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And why that bothered me was who wrote the book of Numbers? <laughs> Moses. Moses wrote the book of Numbers. It doesn't seem like a very humble thing to say. It's like, and I'm the most humble person on the face of the earth. Well, it's likely Moses didn't write that, but it was added. There's an editor, as it were. And that's okay. Now, I'm going somewhere with with all this. There's other passages, like Genesis chapter 36, verse 31, it says this. These were the kings who reigned in Edom before any Israelite king reigned. What's the problem with that? Well, at the time of Moses, there weren't any Israelite kings. So how would he have known about any Israelite kings? In fact, the Israelite kings didn't come for hundred centuries later. Then there was Saul and David and Solomon, you know, and then the kings, right? But he wouldn't have known then, so what is this, you know? Yes, Moses is the primary author of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, but he's not the only one, highly likely, unless he wrote stuff that he knew nothing about. Um, And are you okay with that? Because I am. And in fact, in some ways, it just makes the Bible seem more real to me. Wow, Moses was a, a real person. He's an actual human being. It's not about trusting Moses. It's about trusting the Lord and who writes his 
scriptures. So we don't have time for it, but there are dozens, literally dozens of moments where the primary author of a certain scripture wasn't the only author. And there's other scrolls that are referenced and all all kinds of things that we could get into. Now, there was, however, a final edition where the Tanakh, uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, was like closed. No more editions, no more edits, no more this or that, or like this is how people mourned for Moses. No, nothing else was added. And that was in uh, history demonstrates that that happened about two to 300 years before Christ. And here's what's interesting. Like at that point, like the Old Testament, it's, it's complete. Everybody was quoting from a specific set of scrolls and, and not, a, not a difference. And it, to them, it was both divine and both human. Now, here's what's interesting. A, a secular Hebrew Bible scholar, so he's not a Christian. His name is R.T. Beckwith. He wrote the definitive book regarding the formation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And here's what he says. He says, it's very striking that over a period ranging from the second century B.C. to first century C.E., so many writers of so many divergent groups, that part's important, Palestinian, Hellenistic, Pharisaic, the Essenes, and the early Christians show such agreement about the canon of the Hebrew Bible. None of these witnesses are concerned with asserting the authority of the books they mention. Rather, they all assume Scripture's authority and go on to debate about their interpretation. So they're debating about their interpretation, what certain passages mean, but you know what they're not debating about? which books belong. And here's why that's fascinating. You see that group he mentioned? Palestinians, Hellenistic, Pharisaic, the Essenes, the early Christians who by and large would have been um, a a Jewish as well or Jewish messianic um, believers. They all were different and they all believed some different things and they all would get into arguments and they would all fight about a variety of things and they all lived differently. But the one thing they agreed upon is which writings belonged in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? They didn't fight about that. Now, R.T. Beckwith, that uh, author, he continues. I'll just wrap it up here. It's clear that these groups do not speak simply for themselves, but represent Judaism as a whole. Any inference that the canon, so that's the, the books that, not the, military device with C-A-N-N-O-N, just one, well, there's two N's. Anyway, the canon, um, so that's the books that belonged in the the scriptures, okay, Um, that the canon was decided by councils must be abandoned. The role of later councils was not to decide the canon, but to confirm decisions about the canon already reached in other ways. Now, he's again, he's talking about our Old Testament but we need to dismiss this notion that a group of people decided which books belong and which books did. No, it was more organic. I would say it's the providence, the hand, the divine uh, hand of God was on that process and there was, there was a movement and growth and the, the scriptures solidified themselves. The, this is the Old Testament and even the people who disagreed about everything else didn't disagree about that. So there you go. That's just some ideas about the, um, the Hebrew scriptures. Now, this might seem really obvious, um, and it should be. Uh, it should be to me, too. But I remember one day, I was in my Hebrew class, and my professor said something like this. The scriptures are both divine and human, similarly to Jesus being both divine and human. And I don't know what it was, but it like something clicked in me. That makes sense. I don't understand totally that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human, but it resonates with me. I don't totally understand how the scriptures are divine and human, but like that kind of, it makes sense to me. Jesus was perfect in his character, but it's not like he just floated around in some ethereal body, you know, glowing and never blinking, you know, and yes, my child. You know, it wasn't that, all right? He experienced pain. He sweat. He got tired. He bled. Obviously, he gave his life. So he was fully human. The scriptures, too, are fully human, 
but they're also fully God. So we can with confidence say, this is the word of the Lord and they are trustworthy, which we will talk about another time. Now, I know we've spent most of our time talking about the Old Testament, but I wanna share something really quick, take us maybe 90 seconds. Here was a process by which um, the, the decisions were made which writings uh, uh, um, should be allowed in the, in the New Testament. Now, you could write, read books on this. Okay, so this is so oversimplified, maybe I shouldn't even share it, but there's five tests, at least, for scriptures to be confirmed in the New Testament in particular. Number one is authority. Does this writing have authority? In other words, does it say things like, the Lord told me, thus saith the Lord, God spoke, and whatever, you know? Is there authority, divine authority behind it? Number two, authorship. What, who was it written by? Are they trustworthy? Did they live a godly life? In fact, there's a, there's a handful of books in the New Testament that were initially disputed, but they weren't disputed by and large because of their content. Most of them were disputed by their authorship. So some of you know that the book of Hebrews, there's, there's debate about who the author of Hebrews is. And at the end of the day, they decided, no, Hebrews belongs, even though we're not totally 100% sure maybe who wrote it. That, that's okay, but authorship was important. Third was authenticity. Is this writing consistent with the rest of Scripture? Because Scripture doesn't contradict itself. So authors, or authority, authorship, authenticity. And then is it alive and active, right? That's what Scripture says, that the Word of God is, is living and, and powerful. Does this have the power to transform, to impact lives is do we see the presence of the holy spirit at work through these writings through these scriptures as they're as they're the, distributed and passed around and and uh, that sort of thing alive and active and then the last one was it accepted acceptance by jesus and specifically the the apostles now uh, by and large almost all the new testament writings were written by apostles people who spent a lot of time with jesus and you say well paul didn't well, not as much as the 12 disciples, but he did spend time with the Lord and he heard the Lord's voice and the Lord spoke to him and, and he was unique in that way, but he was, Apostle Paul is definitely an apostle. That's why we call him an apostle. But if you notice, we don't add books to the New Testament writings because the apostles have all passed away and they're with the Lord fully in his presence now, but uh, there, there's no need for additional scriptures. So the New Testament canon has been closed. By the way, did you know that Jesus himself quoted, I think, 24, at least 24 books of the Old Testament, which is very interesting because if Jesus is okay with the Old Testament, like, well, he rose from the dead, so I'm gonna be on his team, you know? I'm gonna be on his side and agree with him. So there's just some thoughts, you guys. The Bible's a library. It's a connected story. It's both divine and human. And lastly, the last thing I didn't mention before is it all points to Jesus, our Savior. Our God is committed to this world. It's a weird thing to say. He's committed to this world. He's committed to this you, to you. He's committed to revealing himself. He's committed to uh, rescuing, saving, redeeming the world. This, this is his plan. It's not all that he does, but this is the message of scripture. And it's imperative that we read the scripture so that we see our need for God and we see his saving power. That's why it's called the good book. And friends, I'm not the greatest preacher and proclaimer of the Bible in the wor world, but the craziest thing has happened is I've taught God's word. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people give their lives to Jesus, baptize, grow in faith. Their marriages have changed. Um, kids coming back to the Lord. Um, radical transformation. I've seen the most hardened, like that's the last person you'd ever find in church, ask me to like, hey, will you spend some time with, with me and help me understand God more? The word of God is powerful, it's beautiful, it is human and it's divine. And so let's have confidence in it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your good word. We love you so, so much. We uh, enjoy your word. We love it. We don't worship it. We worship the God of your word. Help us to keep that perspective as well. May we, um, may our faith grow. May we not be so easily uh, shaken. And um, 
Um, Father, we just do pray that specifically through, through every Bible teaching church and specifically this church, Cedar Grove, that as your word goes forth and as your spirit is active, that you will transform many lives. I don't know who's listening right now that needs that transforming uh, work in their life, but, but there are people listening, God, that they need to be fed or reminded or comforted or, or maybe confronted about some sort of rebellion or they just need to be changed or, or maybe there's some even listening now that need to be introduced to you, the God who saves through your son, Jesus, and by your spirit. So may this be the day of their salvation, this day. They repent, turn to you, live for you, and grow in you through your word. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you guys, thank you so much for uh, joining us in uh, today and through this series, two more weeks. But before you go, let's worship our God. Let's lift up our voices and exalt his name. He is worthy of doing that. Cross 
listen. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we 